up. I looked in the mirror today and I noticed that my hair was extra frizzy and curly. And out the window, or I guess not out the window, but outside, it's really humid. And the two are actually connected. Um, so humidity can cause your hair to get frizzy and curly and it all has to do with water getting in the way of like and rearranging bonds in your in a protein in your hair called keratin and it's pretty cool so these the strands of proteins are forming these things called hydrogen bonds which are these like non-permanent bonds and so your hair the strands in your hair they form these bonds with one another and that kind of like locks your hair in the shape and then the water comes in and it's like I'll take that and so like the water can then form new bonds and it can slip in between and make your hair um, form in different ways and then the frizziness so like the water can like seep in so basically when it's humid there's a lot of air there's a lot of water in the air and there's a lot of water in your hair and not a lot of water in your hair so especially if you have dry hair the water is going to go in there and it can actually like cause the cuticle in your hair to like break and then it looks all frizzy um, so that's the basics and now I'll show you some like graphics to help explain what I'm talking about oh and I'll also explain why like your hair like a perm doesn't like get like change or whatever like the water's not what making perms permy that's why they stay permy even if you like wash your hair or whatever so you might notice that your hair gets like straighter when you wash it that's because like you're just like soaking the hair in water so instead of forming the like all those bonds like those more stable bonds between the protein strands like with that are water mediated it's actually just kind of like making them super slippery and so it's just gonna like your, those protein strands just kind of like slide around and stuff and that's why like then if you when it dries though there's less there's less water to like help make those bonds and so then they're gonna form differently um so and they're gonna form in the way that your hair is so if you like crunch up your hair when it's or braid it or like put it in curlers when it's drying then you can get it to dry with a curl um but that curl will go away again if you then wash it because then you're making all the strands really slippery but in a perm those actually involve a different kind of bond called like a type of covalent bond called like a disulfide bond so that's actually like stable bonds between the protein strands like co they're actually covalent bonds because they're like sharing electrons so they're they're like the bonds that keep the strands of protein proteins but they're forming between strands so that's why you can have like permanent um like curliness and um what a perm does is they kind of they break those bonds um so they're like the bonds that they're covalent so they're stable like the bonds that are make up the protein strands but they're a slightly dip they have like a weakness they're um like if you they're formed through oxidation so if you add like a um, a reducing agent it'll actually break those without breaking up the protein strands um, and then you can then reshape the hair um, and then add an oxidizing agent which will reform those bonds um, so those are only between a special kind of um, one of the like protein letters so amino acid cysteine can form these disulfide bridges um, so between the cysteines um, residues on the different strands and those are permanent uh, until you like oxidize or, or reduce and then oxidize them or whatever so that's why your hair perms can be permy um, like permanent but uh, those like water curl curls are like more temporary okay let me just show you some figures but I can't talk too much because I'm just taking a quick break from thesis writing because my brain needed a rest way more in this blog version from a couple years ago when I still had time to make nice graphics and blogs and stuff um so I'm just gonna like walk you through some of the stuff um here and a few figures but if you want more um go to the picture okay so basically what we're going to be talking about involves um intermolecular and intramolecular forces or molecular forces occur between different molecules um and so they can be different types but the important thing like so so much of biochemistry and chemistry and everything is the idea that opposite charges attract and like charges repel um and so that concept in biochemistry what you really have to be thinking about a lot is that partial charges can um, 
are still charges. Um, so even if you have like, so an ion is a pos is like a charged molecule. It's always charged, but you can have like polar molecules or even nonpolar molecules that get um, have their charges spread out or whatever. So for now, just know that if you have like a separation of charge within a molecule, so like one part's more positive and one part's more negative, that can um, that can in cause those interactions and so when you have like a separation of charge we call it a dipole and so um where these you could have um these dipoles forming because basically all of these charges are forming because element so molecules are made up of atoms which are made up of subatomic particles and some of those are charged um so basically atoms are made up of protons neutrons and electrons the protons are positively charged the electrons are negatively charged um, the electrons hang out in this like cloud around the central nucleus, which has the protons and the neutrons. Um, and so this cloud is like sometimes you'll see things drawn in like these like Lewis dot structures or whatever, where you see these rings. Um, but in reality, the electron electrons are kind of like in this big cloud, and they can kind of move around. Um, and so they like to be certain places within a molecule. So even like, so take a water molecule, it's neutral overall, but the, um, the oxygen is what we call electronegative. So it's really hoggy on the electrons. So even the ones that it's supposed to be sharing with these hydrogens. So basically one of the reasons why these, um, those like dot structures are so useful is because they can help us like understand bonding. So like in bonding, um, so like covalent bonding, which are the strong bonds that hold together molecules, they're actually sharing pairs of electrons, so they like merge their electron clouds. Um, ionic bonding isn't really bonding because they're just like, they're actually like exchanging electrons, um, and then they're just hanging out because they're opposite charged. Um, but with covalent bonding, these are these strong bonds that you're actually sharing electrons, so you're merging those clouds. But even if when you're not merging the clouds, you can still be like shifting around the electrons within the clouds, like within a molecule. And this is how you can get partial charges, like sep charge separated in a neutral molecule. So water's neutral, but oxygen's really hoggy. It's electronegative. So it's gonna pull those, um, it's going to pull the electrons towards it and it's going to be partly negative and then the water's partly positive. And the end result is that water molecules are really sticky to one another. Um, so, because they have all those positive parts and all those negative parts. And so the positive parts are going to want to stick to the negative parts and it's that sort of thing. But those other, the positive and negative parts don't have to just be from other water molecules. Um, and so water can form what we call hydrogen bonds. Um, so they're, um, they're not covalent bonds. They're not sharing electrons. But they're also not ionic bonds because they're not evolving full charges. But so they're a type of um, non-covalent bond that um, they're a, a strong non-covalent bond though. They're not as strong as the salt bridges or the I, which is another word for like um, uh, ion, ion and bond, like an ionic bond because they're not involving full charges. But the hydrogen bond, basically what it is, is you have a hydrogen and then like a lone pair of electrons on something um, that's... Um, so you have this, like, what you often see it is like between water molecules and also like in peptide backbones and between the peptide chains. And so a peptide is just like, um, a protein is a long strand of amino acids and they have this like backbone that has um, this. So basically you just need a donor, which is an H bound to something electronegative. So remember we talked about like electronegative is electronogginess, so like oxygen, which makes that hydrogen partly positive. And then, um, an acceptor, so you have something electronegative, so with a lone pair of electrons. Um, so that's that's kind of like this this like donor acceptor thing is kind of what makes these hydrogen bonds special, uh, because you have to have those that situation. But it's really just a you can have similar types of bonds in um, like non covalent interactions with things um, from all sorts of things. Like even if you just have like temporary shifting of nonpolar molecules and all that stuff. Um, but those, the hydrogen bond is really defined by this, like, this combination of these two things. And it, because it involves that, like, lone pair and stuff, um, it has specific, like, geometry and, like, spatial stuff that it has to be in in order to be its strongest. Um, 
but these hydrogen bonds are like a strong form of non-covalent bond. So they're stronger than those like temporary ones. Um, I mean, but they're still temporary. They can still be changed, but when the water molecules are kind of like just slipping around and stuff, and then they can change and change and change. So that's why if it's like really your hair is really wet, then it can all be slippery. So, but basically, your so proteins um, are made up of like long chains of amino acids, and they one of the ways that they get their structure. So it's like these long chains of amino acids, which are like protein letters. And then one of the ways they get the structure is that they, the protein letters, they have these unique side chains or R groups, and they can have different properties that can interact with other um, like things and cause the protein to fold up in a certain way. And so these side chains can also interact. So they can interact with side chains in like other molecules or within them. Um, so you can see like hair can form hydrogen bonds um, between side chains on different like strands of the keratin. And then ignore these yellow ones for now. Those are the strong disulfide bonds that like the perm messes with. Um, so if you add water, now water can form bonds with the hair. Um, and then water can also like make bonds between strands of the hair and that sort of thing. But it's not messing with these peptide bonds and it's not messing with these disulfide bonds. And so with these disulfide bonds, they involve the amino acid cysteine. Um, and cysteine can do this thing called um, like it can form like strong bonds to um, to other cysteines and like other strands of the protein, or like same strands of the protein if it's all crunched up or something. Um, but in order to break those bonds, so people with like really curly hair, they like naturally have a lot of these bonds. Um, but so you can't just like straighten it by getting it wet, uh, or at least um, it'll curl right back. But if you add like a reducing agent, so that's something that'll break those bonds and then reform them. So, and this is why I said it was kind of like, these bonds are sensitive to reducing and oxidizing or whatever, but the peptide bonds making up the protein backbone are really stable and they're not going to be affected. Um, so your hair strands will stay strands, but you can change the um, way in which they are linked together. Um, and as to the humidity so basically it's just like water the water molecules like we talked about they're really sticky um, and so like they they try everything like wants to be a gas basically because that means they get to be really free and they don't get stuck to other things which that's not really how it works but when a water molecule is like free there's less things to run into and stick to um, and when you have hot, it's when it's hotter, so the water molecules have more energy, so they can break free more easily, so you can get more water in the air, and then that water ends up in your hair. Um, so yeah, so temperature is just like an average of kinetic energy. Um, so when you have a higher temperature, the molecules have more energy. So even if they're below the boiling point, so it doesn't have to be like water boiling temperature. I'm um, like, if you have um, water that's like at the surface or that sort of thing, then you it just has to like overcome the atmospheric pressure and not the pressure of like all the other water on top of it and around, that sort of thing um and then it's easier to do that when it is hotter um and so yeah so you have more water in the air um yeah so it's not that the water that the air can like hold more water or whatever when it's hot it's just like that there's more water molecules that have the energy to actually get into the air. Um, okay, and that's basically it. If you want to learn more about humidity, I have a post on that. But check out this whole long post if you want more on this hair stuff. Um, and now I'm going to go back to thesis writing.